both sides in this horrible, toxic culture battle that's going on are talking about identity as if it's something that's under threat for them and something that they've lost and something they feel attached to and something that the other side wants to take away from them, you know? And there's, it's a very curious thing. I don't think, you know, a healthy society doesn't have stuff like this going on. Hello and welcome. This is Lockdown TV from Unheard. Our guest today I'm really excited about, he's called Paul Kingsnorth. Uh, you may not have heard of him, you may have heard of him, but he's a big thinker, uh, a former activist in the environmental movement, and now a novelist, poet, who lives on his own farmstead out in Western Ireland in County Galway. So, hi Paul, can you see me and hear me? I can see you and hear you, Freddie. Thank you. So, there's a lot that I would love to get into in the time we have. Um, these are big topics, and I know part of what you're against is the kind of mediated technological world so it's going to be a bit of a challenge to tackle it via Skype. Yeah here we are on Skype. <laughs> um, but we'll do our best. So yeah, exactly. let's start by giving a sort of introduction. You were formerly an activist in the environmental movement and you've since left that behind and you've moved out to Ireland. You've sort of turned your back more on not just environmentalism as it was conceived but kind of on a whole way of life haven't you? I grew up in the west of, in the northwest of London, in a in a suburban house, and very much a kind of urban lifestyle, suburban lifestyle. But when I was young, I was taken on a lot of long mountain walks by my dad, and we used to walk walk across the Pennines for weeks on end, and walk across the the Welsh mountains and the and the moors and and the wild places. So I had something something sank into me that was a, some sort of inexplicable deep connection to the natural world and I didn't quite know what it was and I spent many years sort of trying to work out what that was. Um, when I went to university I ended up getting politicized. This kind of love of nature turned into uh, an, a sort of activist drive I suppose as it does for a lot of people. Um, I got involved in the road protest movement back in the mid-90s um, and from there into anti-globalization politics and anti-corporate activism and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and what happens is, is when you become an activist in that way, you start pulling on threads. So you start saying, okay, this, this road is being built through this piece of historic downland and it's destroying this ancient woodland. Why are we building the roads? And then you start spiraling upwards and you, you, you discover answers about economic growth. And then you discover what globalization is and you discover corporate power and you discover capitalism and all of this. So you start to understand the kind of, uh, the growth mentality of the economic monster that we're all kind of in. Um, and that, that informs a lot of activists then as now. Um, and like a lot of people, um, I ended up, you know, campaigning against climate change, wanting to turn around really the whole direction of industrial society, which is what you sort of end up having to campaign for in some way. Because what you end up seeing, if you are an activist long enough and you do enough sort of thinking and reading and and, and and the rest of it is that we have built this enormous unsustainable economic monster that now envelops the world, which requires endless growth to keep it going. It isn't possible to feed it with enough natural resources to power that endless growth. The fossil fuels that it uses to power that endless growth are changing the climate. So we all know these terrible stories. We've kicked off a mass extinction event. The climate is changing all, all of the kind of horrors. So you end up having to try and turn this around. Um, you end up campaigning to stop climate change. And after many, many years of doing that, I was unable to avoid the reality, as it seemed to me, and it still does, that it actually isn't possible to do it um, in the way that we wanted to do it. You are, for example, not going to stop climate change at this point. It's not possible. And you're not going to somehow abolish capitalism either until it abolishes itself by collapsing. Um, and I think a lot of activists get to the point where they see this and it's sort of go into a form of denial, um, and I did for a while, until I just had to accept that that was the case. Um, and I also had to accept something else, which is that environmentalism was becoming so technocratic, so obsessed with technological solutionism, that actually it was almost doing as much damage as it wanted to prevent, um, in terms of the, the wild lands being destroyed by uh, giant solar arrays and barrages on the rivers and the kind of techno solutionism of nuclear power and all of this kind of stuff. So I'd really got to the point where I didn't believe in that kind of environmentalism anymore. Um, not because I'd stopped caring about nature or that I didn't think people should do things to protect it, they should, but because I could see that we weren't going to turn that machine around anytime soon. So that sort of um, 
precipitated a bit of a crisis in me, which as usual, I dealt with by writing about it. And eventually, you also, you, you moved to Ireland and you, you left the kind of urban life behind and you are living closer to the land. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, look, I'm lucky enough to have been able to do that. Um, uh, my wife, who was a former psychiatrist, um, who had become as disillusioned with what she was doing as I had, I suppose. Um, we were, you know, 10 years ago, we had already decided that we wanted to go and try and live differently. It's a kind of secession from the system, which is always a good idea if you can, if you can manage to do it in some way. Um, I've been talking about nature and writing about nature for 25 years, but I didn't really actually live in it or know how to do anything practical, really. And as, as is true with so many of us. So yeah, we, we, we were able to find ourselves a little bit of land and a house we could afford. And we just came here and we homeschool our kids and we grow as much food as we can. And I resist any sort of um, attempt to paint it as a rural idyll because there's no such thing. But there is such a thing as being able to get your hands dirty. And it makes a difference to me as somebody, certainly as a writer who lives in his head all the time, actually, to be able to do that um, and to sort of put your money where your mouth is a bit. But also, one of the things I feel about this giant kind of machine, as I call it, that, that is enveloped us now and is enveloping us faster and faster, and you kind of alluded to it at the beginning, is that it's creating for us this kind of hyper reality, this mediated life in which the world we are all moving towards is almost a kind of virtual reality. And ultimately, it will be a virtual reality because our, our role, all of us, is just cogs in this machine, which is kind of being designed by states and capital and the the, the the heroes of Silicon Valley. Um, and we're pretty much encouraged to be powerless. And in that, in that kind of situation, any self-reliance that you can get for yourself is, is a radical act. Um, for me, I'm, I continue to be inspired by quite an old fashioned version of the green movement. You know, the original green thinkers of the sixties and seventies, the EF Schumacher's and the Leopold Kors. And it's very much about uh, what Ivan Illich called appropriate technology. You know, how much can we make ourselves as self-sufficient as possible, as self-reliant as possible? How many skills can we learn? And can we learn to live within limits? Which is a big question for me personally. And I think it's a question for us as a culture because we have, as I say, this giant economic machine, which always needs growth, always needs to expand and always needs all of us to break down all of our limits in, in almost all regards so that we can continue to consume and consume and consume. And the way... The way off that treadmill is is literally if you can in whatever way you can to try and step back so your act then instead of faced with a system that is so big and moving at such a pace that you didn't feel you were going to over either overthrow it or change its course your act of rebellion as it were was to withdraw from it yeah to a degree to a degree i mean what i would say is you can never you can never withdraw because this is the world we're talking about right so you can't withdraw from it completely and you shouldn't want to because you're connected to everything in it um so it isn't possible to just sort of hide away on the margins or rather it is but it's it's not quite what i'm doing you know we're bringing up our kids here and they're involved in the world and here i am on the internet so it's not it's not a total withdrawal but as much as possible as i say it's an act of self reliance um when i when I wrote my first book, which is 20 years old now nearly, which makes me feel very old, um, that was a book about resistance to globalization. And it came out in 2003. It was called One No Many Yeses. And I spent nine months traveling the world and I visited a lot of communities that were being destroyed or challenged by this model of hypercapitalism, by neoliberalism effectively. Um, and I spent time with tribal people in West Papua and I spent time with the Zapatistas in Mexico and with people in the townships in South Africa and various people, you know, people in Europe too, um, campaigning against the G8. And what I saw was that then actually as now as well, I think, the fundamental means of any kind of rebellion to this machine is in whatever way you can do it, some form of, of self-reliance as a community or as a person. I was very inspired by the Zapatista movement down in Mexico, which um, it originally took up arms against the North American Free Trade Agreement, the first uh, movement in history that's been a rebellion against a treaty rather than a government. And they were very much opposed to what neoliberalism was doing to the, the, the tribal people, to not tribal people, the indigenous people of Chiapas. Um, but they were also very 
rooted in their culture, very rooted in time and place. So there's a kind of rooted rebellion going on there in which they say, OK, well, look, here's here's what we are. And we are trying to put up some form of barrier um, against this this machine that's coming coming to eat us, whilst at the same time actually being a very kind of internationalist minded movement. Um, it's very, very interesting to me, inspiring form of of resistance. So um, some form of yeah, some form of secession um, is is useful and interesting, I think. Possibly with the hope that it can kind of keep alive some sort of wisdom. Uh, until some future moment of collapse, potentially. At one point in your writings, you talk about the monks and the monasteries holding, you know, keeping copies of the Bible and, and keeping the kind of flame of Christianity alive during the Dark Ages and the like. Do you I mean, do you, do you think there's a parallel there? Well, I don't know if I've got any wisdom, but um, I do think that we're heading into a really dark and difficult time. I think that this global machine is going to keep running and running until it's consumed everything it can consume. Um, despite the many heroic attempts of various activist groups and others, it isn't really possible to turn it around on a global scale, not least because if we're honest with ourselves, we like the fruits of it, right? We all like what modernity gives us in terms of comfort, at least those of us who are lucky enough to have that in the, in the rich world. Um, people don't want to turn away from that. So I don't see any way in which this is not going to continue to eat the, uh, the the wild world, continue to change the climate, continue to sort of uproot people all over the world and kind of feed us into this market machine that we've created everywhere. So it's, it's a very difficult time for people. Um, there is all you can do is what you can do, actually, is, is really all, all I can say on it. There's no there's no we have a tendency, I think, especially sort of intellectual talky people like us to come up with. To, to identify a big problem and then want to create a big answer to it, you know, to come up with a sort of five point plan to save the world. They don't usually work. They often create more problems than they solve. Um, so the solution ends up being quite piecemeal and quite local. And you do what you can do where you can do it. Um, you sort of start from where you stand, if you like. So that to me is, you know, it's all I can do. All I can do is I can work some land here. I can teach my kids as much as I can teach them about this. And I can write some things which might be useful and which might help me to work out what the hell I think about it. That's, just, that's all I can manage. What do you say to those people who find it quite a bleak vision um, in that having given up on the, the larger machine, if you feel like it's he headed for catastrophe one way or the other, um, you know, maybe you should have retained some hope in it. Maybe there are good things coming out of it. Maybe at least around the edges and maybe it could be turned around in, in part and you know the, the machine might benefit from your input. Well the, the, the machine has my input here we are I mean it's um, look it's it's very easy to get black and white about it and, and to, to sort of see a terrible destructive monster that you have to run away from but as I said you can't do that anyway we're all enmeshed in this so all you can do is think the only way I can see this is okay what, what can I put what wheel can I put my shoulder to am I going to keep pushing this destructive machine in the direction it's going, which is a direction which I think ends up basically destroying human freedom and, and, and creating a sort of artificial world to replace the one that we've, we've got now. I mean, this is basically the direction we're heading in towards a kind of what I regard as a very frightening uh, hyper reality, a sort of transhuman future, the kind the science fiction writers have been warning us about for 100 years. Um, and those science fiction warnings seem to be being taken as blueprints by the guys in Silicon Valley at the moment. Um, we can either do that or we can we can push in a slightly different direction. In terms of hope, um, uh, I found myself, and I know other people have felt this because they've written it to me, um, that actually you can end up feeling very hopeless if you have to pretend to believe something you don't believe. So if you have to pretend that you can stop climate change in 10 years if you just make enough effort, that can be a very difficult thing to carry because at some level you don't believe it. You're like a priest who doesn't believe in God, but he has to stand up and give a sermon every Sunday. And actually accepting that that isn't possible feels like a big weight off your shoulders. And at that point, you can then think, OK, well, what is possible? What can I still do that will be useful? And there's a million things you can do that are useful because actually there's a lot of hope and beauty in the world. Um, but I think that it's just a, to me anyway, it's a question of just trying to be honest and realistic about where we actually are and what is possible and what isn't. Describe what it is you think the rest of us over here are doing 
wrong, I suppose. I mean, you're, the, in your books, you're, you talk about um, how we've somehow become detached from what matters most. We have built all of these layers of technology which separate us not just from nature, but from a whole sort of understanding of our place in the world. I mean, tell us, what is it that you think is, is wrong with the, the, the modern world we are building? Oh, look, I mean, this is my perspective, right? A lot of people love this and, and think that what I'm saying is nonsense. So, of course, they're entitled to that view and maybe they're right. Um, but from my perspective, um, the things that I value most are being eaten by, um, as I say, this kind of technological monster. I mean, like rooted human cultures, uh, wild nature, natural beauty, um, a sense of slowness and peace uh, that can be found in those in the best of those places um, are being transformed into a kind of uh, a consumer desert. Um, that was to some degree what my first book was about. And my second book, which was called Real England, was an investigation in how, into how local cultures in my country were being, again, raised and homogenized and replaced by this kind of consumer shopping mall experience that we're all familiar with now. And really, you know, the 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 machine of industrial capitalism, which has been colonizing and enclosing people around the world for the last 300 years or so, has as its goal creating a sort of one world global marketplace in which we are all consumers. Um, we're not citizens, we're not people rooted in a culture, we're not in individuals who have a, a sort of wider sense of worth, we're primarily consumers and producers for that for that machine, we measure everything in terms of economic growth. We measure that in a material sense rather than in any other sense. We've become a kind of a society of, of merchants and those consumer values have infiltrated everything, absolutely every aspect of our lives from the, from the health service to, to, the, um, to the art scene, to education, all around the world. These are the values that have been really pushed primarily by Western corporations and their enablers since the second world war. So we're trying to create this great giant global consumer marketplace in which we are primarily consumers and secondarily producers and I think that's a I think that's a tragedy it's a cultural tragedy and it's an ecological tragedy too. Do you think the all of the political turbulence of the past few years is connected to this? In your book Real England talked about searching for a kind of English spirit that somewhere was there beneath all of the tarmac of all of the shopping malls um, maybe that found expression in the Brexit vote and similarly the other populist waves around the world. I mean, do you think it, they are connected? I think there's, yeah, I think they can be. I think it's interesting. What, what I feel is that um, this, this consumer machine fundamentally makes everybody homeless, I think. And that to me is, seems to be the most important thing about it because we're, we, we're, we stop becoming citizens, we stop becoming humans, members of a community, members of a culture, and we start becoming uh, global consumers, if you like. Um, we have to, you know, we're, we're, up, we're, we're uprooted from our place, we're, we're expected to go where the money is, we're expected to go where capital needs us, where the jobs are, um, we're expected to be upwardly mobile, we're expected to value the, value the, the to value the, the values, if you like, of commerce over everything else then I think we end up with a sense of homelessness. Who are we? Where do we come from? Where are our roots in time and place? And I think there is a real sense that so many people feel uprooted by it, by it because they literally have been uprooted all over the world in so many ways, um, physically, spiritually, culturally, that there's a sense of, there's a great sense of loss amongst a lot of people, especially in the modern world. The more modern and the more westernized the world is, the more lost people seem. And I do think about the kind of culture war stuff, which is so toxic in this sense. And I don't know whether it's true, but it seems to me that both sides in this horrible, toxic culture battle that's going on are talking about identity as if it's something that's under threat for them and something that they've lost and something they feel attached to and something that the other side wants to take away from them, you know. And there's, it's a very curious thing. I don't think, you know, a healthy society doesn't have stuff like this going on. Right, we're not fighting each other about identity every day, wherever we come so from. So, in other words, so, whether you're a sort of Trump voting uh, white person in rural America, or whether you feel like a, your minority group is somehow under threat in an urban centre, 
it's a similar potentially it's the same kind of alienation that comes from the same but it, it seems like that doesn't it i mean it seems to me like uh, yeah there's a sense of a, a, a sense of a threat to your identity a sense that a certain type of racial or cultural identity has become more important um the more alienated we've become and the more uprooted we've become the more more sunk into the same i mean curiously enough you know we're all, we're all looking at the same screens all day right we've all got the same smartphones we're all looking at the same facebook feeds and yeah, at the same time as this this machine has made us more homogenous, we've become more attached to a sense of you know who I am, and that's very important to me. And I think that's there's got to be a connection between those two things. The more uprooted we become, the more at some level we think, well, who am I? Where do I come from? What's my identity? And we get then we start to cling to that, and the more we cling to that, the more we're capable of getting drawn into the um, the online identity wars and the algorithms that make us want to hate each other. And then off we go. Can one call it a kind of universalism that has been the problem? Because being virtuous and progressive and having a, a vision for the future has, in recent decades anyway, been about a kind of universal values and, and minimizing differences between people. Um, maybe people want differences back. Well, yeah, they probably didn't. Yeah, I think they probably do. I mean, it, again, it strikes me that if I look on, on the sort of progressive left in the culture war, there's a lot of people talking about the, the importance of racial and cultural identity all the time, obviously. And then on the other side in the culture war, uh, increasingly and disturbingly, you've got you, you've got a bunch of white nationalists doing the same thing. But you've also got more benign nationalists saying that our national identity is important to us. And again, all of those people are saying this sense of who I am, which is defined by a cultural identity that comes from a place, is important to me. And the only reason you would need to be fighting about that is if you felt that it was under threat. Um, and so there is a sense of universalism, but it's not, I mean, look, there are different ways to be universalist, aren't there? You can be universalist in your sense that we're all human and we should all act from love and cooperation, which seems to me to be kind of a basic level of decent humanity that everybody should be engaging in. And then there's this kind of universalism, which is very tied up to um, global capitalism, which is effectively creating this borderless world in which there's a giant corporate capitalist marketplace in which everybody's drinking coke and everybody's wearing blue jeans and everybody's watching netflix and that is the the model of corporate globalization that's been spread around the world since the second world war primarily by the us and by its supporters in the west and increasingly by corporations elsewhere and that requires us to create a giant borderless placeless world in which we're all fundamentally the same and the only thing we have in common as i say is our sense of consumerism one of your essays in your uh, earlier book, which is your collection of um, essays, Confessions of a Recovering Environmentalist, uh, was called Quants versus Poets. Um, and in a sense, that's a parallel but very related distinction, isn't it, between the way of thinking about the world as in a kind of purely rational, mathematical, scientific way uh, versus a more poetic way where there are other things. And, and I, I wonder whether you think in the last year, this year of COVID, that quants versus poets distinction has become even more marked because we've been having so much data and so many numbers about the movement of this virus. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of people who simply don't recognize that as a way of explaining their world and, and reject it. Have you seen that distinction? The, the, there are potentially two ways of looking at the world which ought to be complementary. There's the kind of mythic way of looking at it, and then there's the, the rational way of looking at it. So you've got sort of mythos versus logos, and you know we often see that represented as the right and the left brain, which is a useful, uh, useful metaphor, even if it's not science. Um, so we have a very rationalistic, very uh, secularistic, scientific, mathematical way of looking at the world, right, which is useful. Obviously, we need to, to behave like that, otherwise we can't function. But we also have something which is deeper and to some degree truer than that, which is the mythic way of looking, which is, you know, which is where true poetry comes from. It's where art comes from, but it's also where I think our deep love of nature comes from. It's where religion comes from. And that stuff flows through absolutely every human being and every human culture always at all times. And I think liberal modernity and neoliberal capitalism as well have operated on the um, the false assumption that the, the, the mythic way of seeing will be ultimately superseded by the rational way, by the logoic way of seeing, if you like. Um, because obviously myth was just a silly old thing we believed in before we have science, so we don't need that anymore. That's not what's happening. You know, there are more religious people in the world than there have ever been. And again, I think you could come back to people's sense of, uh, 
attachment to culture and place. That's a very mythic thing. They can't, they can't really be rationalized. What's identity? What does it mean? Why did you choose that sense of identity? What's your country? Why are you... I mean, it's interesting to me that so many people on the left have spent so many decades trying to um, sort of disintegrate the notion of nationhood in a way and say that it's all a social construct. And in one sense, it is a social construct. And yet people still feel very attached to it all over the world. So something's going on, which is not rational. Um, and we fundamentally are not rational beings. Uh, we hate that idea in the modern world, but <laughs> actually we're not. We're fundamentally beings who operate on intuition and emotion and a sense of what matters to us, which is actually quite mythic. Um, but but we do rationalize it and, and we're moving into this hyper rational computer world of algorithms and, and mathematics. And, and, and COVID is interesting, I suppose, in that way, in the sense that we've all been acting like uh, science is going to solve this, but uh, and yeah, as you say, using the algorithms and the and, and the, the mathematical formula and the rest of it. But it's uh, it, there's also something very mythic about this virus, isn't there? It's very apocalyptic, I think. In the original sense of the word, the word apocalypsis is is Greek for unveiling. It's, it means revelation. Um, it's which revealed a lot about us. It's revealed. So I, I'm really interested in the idea of what COVID has revealed about us all personally, you know, because I think for all of us individually, we've discovered things about ourselves that we might not have noticed before. I've discovered that I'm more sociable than I thought I was, which is interesting. Now that I've been locked down, um, I enjoy being a hermit, maybe less than I thought. Um, but I think as a society, we've seen how much, to me, certainly as an environmentalist or a former environmentalist, the, the, um, the degree to which everything quietened down during the first lockdown was really interesting. The the world with fewer cars on the road, the world with more birds singing, the world with wild animals wandering around in the cities, but also how much we are sort of desperate to get back to normal. You know, we want to get back on the planes, we want to be flying around, we want to be going on holiday, we want the kind of machine to crank up again. Um, and there's something very, there's a kind of deep stream there, which is not rational, but it's something to do with that our sense of meaning and the, and the virus has been a big challenge to that sense of meaning, which has been very, it's, it's you know, it's, it's sort of useful in a tragic way because we have to, it, it's, it's enabled us to sit back and say, well, what do I actually value? What's this society about? Where are we going? Talking about uh, myths, I mean, you could actually see sort of online conspiracy theories through that lens, couldn't you? And the virus has certainly provoked its fair share that actually there's a kind of a group in the global society who just can't understand what people are objecting to. And as far as they're concerned, as long as people take their vaccines and behave according to the latest um, government recommendations, that is what virtue looks like. Um, and it does feel like a lot of these kind of growing groups that are online, for example, there's the whole sort of Bill Gates plus World Economic Forum um, conspiracy around the, the Great Reset. And you know, arguably, you can say, although the details of it are not true, you know, the as a myth, it's quite a well constructed one, you've got the sort of global head of technology and the global head of finance as the two representatives. I mean, do you think online conspiracy theories are part of that mythic realm? Well, it's interesting, this isn't it? Because if we talk about this great machine, this great globalized corporate techno thing that's been building up for so long that I've been writing about for so long in different ways. Um, what it fundamentally does is it removes power and agency from us as individuals and from us as communities. I mean, at the local level, it does that. Um, at the national level, it does that. The governments have so much less power now. Um, so what increasingly, although we have far more technology at our fingertips than we've ever had, you know, here we are talking to each other on a screen across the ocean. Um, we feel more powerless than we ever had. I have no idea how this computer works. If it broke down, I couldn't fix it. Um, and we know that the level of inequality in society is astonishing now. The number of billionaires that exist is revolting. There shouldn't even be billionaires in the world, let alone the number that there are now. We've got a huge amount of economic and technological power and political power accumulating in very few hands, and we don't understand it. So, I mean, you mentioned Bill Gates. It's an interesting one, this, because, you know, you've got all the crazy conspiracies about how Bill Gates is going to inject you with microchips and all this stuff. But there's a realist, as you say, there's a basis for this. Bill Gates is a very powerful man and he's using his money to change the world in particular ways. He's using his money to fund newspapers. He's using his money to promote development in places like Africa in a very particular pattern. 
He's doing certain all sorts of things. And the same is true of Soros, who's always the center of conspiracy theories as well. So although the conspiracies themselves are crazy and often dangerous and unpleasant, the sense of powerlessness that fuels them is real. And I think that these conspiracies come about when people try to join dots that they don't understand because we don't really know how it's working anymore. And to come back again to that sort of early green philosophy of, of self-reliance that I was talking about earlier, um, in a world in which communities are self-reliant and power is within reach of human beings and communities, you don't get that kind of craziness because you can see how things work. And that's really the pre-modern or the pre-industrial world we're talking about. And also in the, in the context of the last year, the possibility of living in a more organic, more natural way becomes much harder if in order to just check in and be a counted member of society, you have to be vaccinated. That, that, that's, do you think that's a, a, do you think, do you have sympathy for people who reject that whole direction of travel and say, no, I want to, to live in a more sort of natural, quote unquote, world? It's, it's vital to allow the freedom to, to, to have that possibility still going on you know and as i say at almost every level all the time the 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 kind of the the power of the state and and the and the corporations if you like are clamping down on that i mean look how how easy is it to live without a smartphone now i mean that's an interesting question do you to have me. a smartphone have, you don't i don't have a smartphone i hate smartphones because they're monitored surveillance technologies and also i don't want to be looking at the internet all the time which i know i would do if i had a smartphone so i haven't got one but it's harder and harder to, to survive without one. And it's, it's po quite possible to imagine in five or 10 years, it being pretty much impossible to say, have a bank account that you can check without having one. Um, and that's starting to happen already. So we're all sort of, we're sucked into this against our will. And it's always the same story, you know, well, this is great, this is good for you. Look at all the stuff you've got that you didn't have. And there's a truth in that, but what you've lost is a sense of autonomy and freedom that you did have before. A lot of what you write about is is uncivilization or slowing down or in some way uh, you, know, you might not call it going backwards but peeling away some of the superfluous layers um, and you've even replaced your toilet with a kind of what is it called I don't even know I'm so yes. I'm so metropolitan I don't even know the word for that kind so of compost toilet it's basically a big bucket <laughs> Uh, so, yeah. you, so you literally you smashed out the, the normal toilet with all its pipes and instead you replaced it with, the, with this bucket. I did do that. We took out the dishwasher at the same time if it's, uh, yeah. if it's yeah. consolation. Yes, so, we did do that. So I read that and thought, good on him. You know, he's, he's practicing <laughs> what he enough. preaches. But <laughs> am I wrong to prefer a mechanical toilet? Well, nobody's wrong to do anything they want to do, are they? I mean, if, if I'm going to live the life I'm trying to live here, if I'm going to try and um, get myself closer to the living world than I was before, then that's one way to do it. It's, um, it's also a great source of, uh, of compost for the garden. You'd be surprised. The, the reaction to the compost toilet always interests me, actually, because it's so <laughs> normal for me now that I've totally forgotten about yeah. it, but other people think it's outrageous. I guess the question is, can you be against, which I think a lot of people would come with you up to a certain point and say that, civilization has become too big, too monolithic, and it, there's a kind of tyranny in that. Uh, and that to break it up and to bring it closer to home so that there were, you know, real cultures that were living together in a more natural way and stuff. I think a lot of people would go along with that, but I think they would still want their mechanical toilets in those smaller, more authentic cultures. You know, can you make a distinction between the bits of civilization we like and the bits of civilization we're less happy about. Yeah, well, I mean, look, of course, people always do, don't they? And, you know, it's, it's not a coincidence that many of the poorest people in the world are desperate for the kind of things that we've got in the rich world, right? So nobody's, nobody's in a position to be telling people who are, who are living in poverty that they shouldn't have X, Y, and Z, right? So, which is why I don't tell anyone what to do, by the way, because I don't, I, you know, this is just how I'm doing things. It's the conclusion I've come to. It's not a model for anybody else. Um, if if the direction of travel bothers you, you're going to have to work out some form of self-reliance from it. You have to make a decision about what matters to you. If you're somebody who says, well, I don't care about any of this, this sounds like nonsense, then you've got no problem. Um, if, on the other hand, any of this does concern you, the direction of travel, the kind of 
clamp down on freedom, the corporate control, the, the, the sort of sense of powerlessness, then you need to think about what I can do about that. And there's no right answer. I was thinking about the kind of creativity of new technology and how that is the best thing we do in some way. Um, you know, whether you're a Bronze Age person inventing a new tool, you know, that's sort of the best of humanity, isn't it? To, to think how better to engage with our environment and invent new technologies. It's, that's sort of the best thing we've got. Um, and so I understand that people in Silicon Valley who think it's akin to just virtue, that innovation is always good because there is something very deep in us that wants to innovate and create. Well, um, firstly, people like me um, sitting on the margins without compost toilet are not really a threat to any of that going on. Uh, nobody in Silicon Valley is listening. Um, but it's, there's an interesting distinction that the, the philosopher even Illich drew between a, a tool and something he called techni, or maybe even you could draw a distinction between a tool and a technology. But, you know, I even wrote an essay about this years ago called Dark Ecology, which looked at the difference between a scythe and a brush cutter um, when you're trying to mow grass. What what does your new innovation do? Does it give you more power as an individual? Does it give you more power as a community? Does it benefit the natural world around you? Or does it take power away from you? Is it Does it rely on, say, external fuel sources like fossil fuels that are damaging? Does it hook you into a web of interdependence? That's a, that's a more useful way of looking at it to me. So you know, humans are always going to innovate. That's what we do. We'll be doing that till we're dead. Um, the question is, what direction of travel are you being taken in by the innovation? And who controls the innovation? You know, uh, does it? I mean, obviously, we're told that all innovation benefits all of us. But does it really? You know, does who's I mean, I don't know who is social, who's benefited from social media, who's benefited from the Alexa that can order your pizza. I mean, these guys are using these things to build algorithms that can monitor absolutely every aspect of who you are and what you do and know you precisely so that they can sell you things. We know very well that social media is developed deliberately so that we get a dopamine hit every time we get a little like or a retweet. And so we spend all our time doing that stuff. So, yeah, maybe we benefit from some of that. We can promote our books and all of this kind of stuff. But there's always a price to pay. So maybe the question to ask is, what price are you paying? And who, as I say, ultimately is controlling this stuff? Where does the, where does the power lie? All of this stuff comes down, as every other political question does, to a question of power. Again, you come back to this machine. Who's running this show anyway? And who's, who are you dependent on? It's always a really useful question. One of the complexities of that, which we get kind of caught out by, is the kind of status um, association with it, that actually it's, it's quite often an elite view that these more simple things are desirable. <laughs> uh, that it, it's quite often the more educated people who have been through it and now miss it, that romanticize living closer to the land, having less technology, the way things used to be, um, you know, whether it was William Morris in the 19th century or we sitting here talking now, you know, and to someone who is coming out of poverty, say, rural poverty, the invention of a flushing toilet or technology that's going to make their life radically easier that will enable them to spend more time thinking higher thoughts, to them feels incredibly exciting and liberating. What do we do about that tension? Well, I think that can sometimes be true, but sometimes it isn't true. I mean, I would say firstly on the technology thing, again, there's a difference between an appropriate technology that makes somebody's life better and a technology that sucks them into a matrix of control. Um, I'm not in the business of telling anyone what technologies they should have, and they wouldn't listen anyway. But all I would say is that in my experience um, of, for example, spending time with indigenous people or landless people, um, very often, actually, again, it comes back to this question of power and control. So we've, we, we've created this great myth around development that everybody in, in the so-called developing world wants to come and be a Western style consumer. Well, yeah, to some degree, people, you know, especially if you're living in poverty, you don't want to live in poverty. That's true. But people are deeply attached to their land. They're deeply attached to their way of living. Um, and very often, people actually are being forced out of, say, small tribal communities that they do not want to leave and into the cities so that they can make smartphones in factories with suicide nets outside the window. 
I mean, years ago, I spent some time in Brazil with the MST, the landless workers movement over there. Uh, and that's a movement of people who have effectively been made landless by um, by large landowners, often forced into cities, having to live in slums. And what they want is what they wanted then certainly was to get their land back again so they could go out into the countryside and be independent. They don't want to be poor. They don't want to live without technology. They don't want to be miserable, but they want the power of having that sense of place, that land, that control. And so again, it all comes, it, this is really a conversation. It's not a question, a conversation about how technology gives you wealth, otherwise you have to be poor. It's really a conversation about power and control and who decides what that should be and who decides what development looks like. There was a good example of that last week when the um, President Xi, president of China, announced to great fanfare that he has lifted 100 million people out of rural poverty in the past five years, I think it was. This was then repeated without criticism on the BBC, on the morning news program. And it just sort of hit me that, you know, what has changed for those 100 million people? It, is it entirely definitely a positive story? Or does it mean that we've just built more ugly, horrible cities that are, you know, devoid of any kind of authentic sense of place? And fast forward one generation, what will those people, what will their lives be like? I mean, do you think we should question those kind of announcements? Certainly in China, the, the, you know, the development push in China has made, for example, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people landless through the construction of dams, through the construction of giant cities. Obviously, the state in China is all powerful. And so people are just moved. Um, and then they're put into cities. And often, if you take people who've been living on their own land in a subsistence economy where they have enough and you put them into a city and they then are earning uh, say wages, but very low wages, and they've lost any sense of control through that process of enclosure that we talked about earlier, then you can stick that on your balance sheet and you can say, look at these people we've lifted out of poverty. Maybe some of them wanted to be, but did, did they? Do we know that? How many people there were dispossessed? How many people were forced against their will off the land? I mean, Arundhati Roy in India has done some fantastic work on this over the years, uh, the building of the Narmada dams over there, and the mass destruction of rural communities by the Indian government, again, always in the name of poverty alleviation. They're doing the same thing now with the farmers. You know, you basically effectively enclose people's land, give it over to corporations, create a development model that benefits global capital. And then you say, oh, look at all these lucky people lifted out of poverty. Um, you know, the, you have to be very careful with these claims because they're claims that very often, as usual, benefit power, not always, but very often. And then, and then we, uh, you know, again, we, we sort of... Um, guilt trip ourselves by saying, oh, well, you know, who would want to stop people from being lifted out of poverty? Well, no, you wouldn't if it was genuinely happening. And sometimes it is. But you've really got to dig into what that means, especially when those claims are made by autocratic governments. The thing that I wasn't quite sure reading your books over the past few days is where you stand on the kind of role of humanity in the world. Because at some points, it feels like humans are a beautiful part of creation and we just need to, you know, try to behave better and be more in harmony with it. Uh, and at other points, you know, I got some flashes of actually humans are pretty much bad. Uh, and if you look at the effect we've had on the world, it's been negative. We need to prioritize the non-human and stop thinking in a, in a kind of human-centered way. Um, and I wasn't really sure where you stand on that. Is humankind a good thing? Yeah, well, uh, you're not sure where I stand because over the years, I've never been quite sure where I stood because like every other human being, as, as Walt Whitman put it, I contain multitudes. So I'm capable of thinking, you know, several different things about humanity <laughs> in a day. Um, it's very difficult to be an environmentalist as I used to be without sometimes despairing about humanity, given the mass destruction that we unleash. Um, but that's not a useful situation to be staying in. You know, you can't allow yourself to end up there. Otherwise, you're kind of nihilistic or misanthropic and ultimately we're human um i think what i you know look um we've got as much right to be here as anything else right we're, we're creatures and we share this planet with uh, billions of other creatures and my view is that for so much of history and in so many parts of the world we have been able to live in reasonable balance with everything else um, it's, it's modernity, it's industrialism, it's, it's this kind of giant fossil fueled machine that has allowed us to, 
to some degree take the worst aspects of our character, the sort of the greed and the ambition and the, the, the more destructive side of our natures and kind of supersize them in a way that has gone so fast that we haven't even really had time to think about it. And so what we're dealing with is the kind of um, the destructive outgrowth of our own technological cleverness, if you like. And that doesn't make humans bad. It just makes humans human. And the, 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 the sort of point I've come to, I suppose, is it's really a question of how we live within limits. It's the old green question, actually. How do you live within limits? How do we rein in our appetites? How do we take the best of us, which is the capacity for love and the capacity for, as you say, creativity, which can benefit everybody, and the capacity for cooperation, all of this stuff, and the capacity to live in a rooted way with the rest of nature? Is it possible to take those things and, and to push forward in that direction and to move away from this kind of destructive um, consumer beast, if you like, that, that, that is somehow consuming us. It's not possible to change the direction of the machine at this point from here, but there's plenty we can do to, to live better, actually. And so, you know, any, anything's possible in that sense, but it, it all starts at home. You've written elsewhere about a recent conversion to Christianity. Do you feel that that has played a part in some way? I mean, Christianity is a very human-centric religion. God became man. Do you feel that that has made you more warm about humankind than you might have been in previous decades? Well, you can't be a misanthropic Christian. Um, you're quite right. <laughs> it's not possible. I'm as surprised at becoming a Christian as anyone else. I have to say, it's something that's happened to me over the last year, which is very unexpected and rather glorious. Um, but I've been on a sort of spiritual search for 10 years or so, I suppose, um, because actually so much of what we've been talking about seems to me to be at root a spiritual question in the broadest sense of that slightly horrible word, um, that it's actually about what we value. And so much of our destructive nature, it seems to me, comes from our sense of self-worship, actually. As I said, once you believe that there's nothing above you, once you believe that there's nothing sacred about the world, that the world is simply a material object, a giant resource that you can harvest, then you can become quite tyrannical. And I think that's what's happened to us. So I've, I've, I've seen it as a kind of spiritual matter, if you like, for a long time. And then, as I say, Christianity kind of blindsided me on that one. So it's, uh, it's, been, it's been rather good. But yes, look, I mean... Has it made you more forgiving of a human-centred understanding of the cosmos? Well, I've always tried to be forgiving uh, based on the, the, my long-term knowledge that I'm probably much worse than everybody else in many ways. I mean, that's one of the things that's nice about Christianity, actually. You start off from the assumption that you're a failed sinner and you work from there upwards. So, yeah, humility, right? I mean, look, it seems to me that if you go and read the Sermon on the Mount... If you go and read the Beatitudes, you've got a recipe for actually solving all the problems we've been talking about for the last hour, right? If, if, you, if the meek are blessed and we're turning the other cheek and we're serving the poor and we're loving our neighbours, and if our neighbours are not just our human neighbours, but they're everything that lives around us, um, and if we're serving rather than trying to rule and all the things that, that, that Christ is teaching us, then this very old message that's kind of got subsumed by various you know corrupt churches and all the rest of it actually when you go back to the roots of it it's a message of radical humility and and voluntary poverty and love and compassion and actually those things are very hard they're certainly hard for me which is why it's good for me to do them um, and to learn them so yeah there's there's all whether whether or not you're a christian actually so much of this comes down to limits it comes down to humility it comes down to what we're prepared to give up or not do and it comes down to how much we're prepared to share rather than attempt to, you know, impose power. And I know these are very old stories, but that's because actually at root, this is a very old human problem. You know, this, it's, it's very interesting to go back to the teachings of Jesus 2000 years ago and see him basically addressing the same you know, flaws in human nature that we have now. Um, and of course, that's not just true of Christianity. So there's a, there's a lesson in radical humility that you can get from it which I hadn't realized until I started to look at it properly. And that's, I'm, I'm still sort of, that, that's still working its way through me. It's quite, it's quite a radical and exciting thing to be happening in a way. Wow, well, thank you for telling us about it, Paul. Uh, and thanks for all your thoughts on this uh, 
big wild journey we just went on for the past hour. The whole world, yes, we've solved the whole world's problems. It's good to know. <laughs> and thanks for having me on. I really appreciated it. That was Paul Kingsnorth, the writer, poet, former environmental activist, talking to us from his farm in the west of Ireland about the environmental movement, global politics, technology, and even at the end there, his conversion to Christianity. Quite an amazing hour. Thank you to him and thanks also to you for joining. This was Lockdown TV.